Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for this month's Agricultural Market Situation Outlook. Uh, continuing on our series of uh, monthly webinars about what's going on in the markets, especially as they pertain to North Dakota agriculture. Uh, following our traditional uh, framework where we're going to have a, a series of presentations uh, followed with a question and answer at the end. Uh, we're using the Zoom webinar license, so there's limited interaction, uh, but we do ask that you ask questions, preferably using that Q&A tool. Uh, and if by chance you, that's new to you, you can also use chat as well. Uh, but we do save all those questions for the end. Uh, just to get things going, because we do have a full docket, we'll move on to uh, Professor Brian Parman. Hey, thanks, Dave. Okay, so today's presentation <clears throat> that I'm going to uh, give is kind of on this, well, pretty much entirely on this USDA report that comes out every uh about this time of year, February, early, early February. And it's the sort of the, it, it's two forecasts really. It shows the data from, in this case, 2019, but then it shows what they expect from what we saw uh, to be the end result of 2020. And then looking forward into 2021 uh, for, for basically a national and then some state stuff on the financial situation. And 2020 is not really over yet uh, simply because there's, lots of producers who still have commodities raised in 2020 that are not sold yet. So that won't be reconciled until later on uh, this year when, when everything gets finalized. But they have a pretty good idea uh, based on um, current prices and, and insurance indemnities and those kind of things of what it looks like. So the, the biggest uh, unknown then becomes uh, 2021. So my first slide um, of the presentation is a uh, what they show for North Dakota. So they do a state by state um, sort of ranking and snapshot of what's going on uh, in each state. And you'll notice it's 2019 because again, 2020 is still, uh, still a forecast, but 2019 North Dakota ranked uh, 22nd in net farm income in 2019 dollars. And you can see uh, in the little uh, slide there, the chart on the right that says net farm income. Uh, right around $1.73 billion, okay? And then in the table in the top, it shows it with just in 2019, over a billion dollars in government payments, uh, 39,000 acres of farmland. And that includes, I believe, pasture land in this case. So it's including both crop and pasture for that with 26,000 individual farms. And the top five production expenses for our state in 2019, capital consumption was just a bit above fertilizer, lime and soil, and that's in the bottom right uh, table. And then on the bottom left table, you'll see the, the largest cash crops that we raised as a state in 2019 with soybeans just edging out by about hundred million wheat and then followed by corn. Now this isn't acres, this is in cash receipts. And then, so after soybeans, wheat, then corn, we had cattle and calves and then, uh, and then canola. So that's just a snapshot of what we looked like in 2019 uh, and where we ranked in net farm income uh, in the country. So my next slide then is the February uh, of this year's USDA net farm income forecast. And what it shows there, if you look to the right, you'll see there's a spike there for 2020, okay? And a lot of that has to do with the CFAP payments. So we did obviously have the big commodity prices rally in the fall, but when you go back and break down the numbers, a big share of that increase over 2019 is the expectation of the higher commodity prices and the CFAP payments. And then you see the projection for uh, this year, 2021, is that it will be uh, considerably lower than, than last year. And in the, in the logic there is that there won't be a CFAP or an MFP and so it won't be dramatically lower. In fact, it's projected to be higher than 2019, even with MFP higher than 2019 due to uh, price prices being expected to be much better, uh, but, but less than last year um, due to the, the loss of either MF, MFP type, at, basically the loss of ad hoc programs. The expectation is this year, there just won't be any. So my next slide is just a table real quick. And what I wanted to show before in, in this, I'm showing this before I show the next two slides because if you look at the middle column 2020 F and F basically means it's forecast, you'll see direct government payments, the gray row is $46.2 uh, billion, okay? 
in 2020. And direct government payments in 2021 are projected to be about 25 billion, similar to 2019. Part of that's going to be CFAP, perhaps overlap, um, other farm programs, those kind of things are all going to be, are included in this number here. But you can see that 2021's uh, direct government payments are gonna be a little bit more than half of what they were in 2020. And so that's the big explanation for why the projection for net farm incomes being down because any kind of income, whether it's direct government payments, sales from crops or livestock or whatever the case may be, that all gets lumped into that net farm income number. So my next slide then shows nominal cash receipts for selected crops. And the big one on the left is corn, for then, and this is national. Uh, the expectation is, is that there's gonna be a lot more money uh, in, in the sale of corn in, in 2021 relative to the last few years. You can see corn quite a bit higher. Same for soybeans, which is the next group, uh, that dark blue column that's taller than the rest. That's 2021's projection. So the cash receipts for soybeans are projected to be quite a bit higher. And then over on the right, um, as it pertains to North Dakota, wheat, uh, 2021, they're expecting it to look a lot like 2020. Now, this doesn't mean necessarily that uh, prices are going to go down or be worse, a lot worse for wheat. This is just saying that the sales receipts are going to be higher. So that can be a combination of better prices as well as more acres planted. Okay, that could, that could be uh, part of the explanation for this. So um, one of the thoughts might be with the rally in corn and soybeans, it might come at the expense of some wheat acres. And obviously, Frayne can talk, talk to that point a lot better than I can. But that I just want to make that clear that it's not necessarily always just because of better prices. You could have more acres and then wind up with uh, higher cash receipts for those crops. So my next slide then shows the same thing, uh, cash receipts, but this is for uh, uh, livestock production. And cattle and calves, cash receipts in 2021 are expected to be better than 2020. And I think in this case, the biggest reason for that is the, the expectation that throughout the course of the year, you're gonna have better prices for, for beef cattle producers than you had in, in 2020. Certainly the first part of 2021 will be Will be more profitable. Now I know that some in, in early part of this year, the price of 800, 850 weight calves has been depressed due to higher uh, feed prices and costs. Uh, but but overall, like at the feeder calf market, has been fa fairly strong. And Tim will talk a lot more about that. But that's that's basically what this is saying. And then you know hogs, broilers, the only group really that's looking to have a worse year this year in terms of cash, not, not government payments, just sale of their commodity is uh, the dairy industry. All right, so my next slide shows the uh, projection for uh, in farm production expenses um, nationally. And if you look, you can see basically that 2021 is kind of projected to be along the same vein as 2020, maybe slightly higher and it's right there to the right. Their production expenses are expected to be about the same, slightly higher in, in uh, heading into this year. And I've given talks about this uh, quite a bit. And, and a big reason for that is the, fer the price of fertilizer that's increased pretty dramatically, as well as feed costs for livestock producers. But the big one for the crop producers is in that big spike in fertilizer prices, especially uh, phosphorus. All right, so my next slide shows direct payments 2015 to 2021. And this just graphically puts into perspective how big that direct government payment uh, ad hoc type MFP CFAP type payment chunk has been. And you see this, that's the red area. So the ad hoc programs would be the red. And if you look at the 2020 portion just above, you'll see the year on the bottom going across the bottom in 2020, you go straight up from that, that's the peak and that's, reflective of some carryover of MFP2 that went into um, 2020. And then you had CFAP in 2020. So you, it, CFAP one and two for that matter. So that's why that area is so big. And then you look at 2021 and it's a lot smaller. I mean, even in 2019, uh, uh, market facilitation there is in the, is in the uh, orange. I'm sorry, I misspoke there, but market facilitations in the orange and how much smaller that is than, than the CFAP percentage. And it's projected to go away. So 2019, we thought we, we had a big ad hoc program payment. 2020 showed us that 2019 was, you know, small compared to what, what's possible. And then there's 2021 
uh, with part of the any any type of ad hoc programs going into it as well. So just to put this into perspective, that uh, the biggest reason for the change in projected net farm incomes headed into the next year is 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 because of the loss of these program uh, the payments that may or may not happen, but they're projecting that they won't. So my next slide is just the solvency, farm financial solvency projection for 2021. And it's basically around the same as it was last year with the debt to asset ratio at about 13.9 and debt to equity at 16. And while this has increased, this debt to asset ratio has come up some, it's still pretty low by historical standards. Uh, we're roughly around where we were in the, in the 90s. Uh, the, the 90s were closer to 15, we're at, we're at 14. So still that debt to asset ratio remains relatively low. But one thing to consider always when you look at these USDA numbers is they take total debt and total assets, do the ratio, and then you wind up here. Uh, a lot of farmland is not, uh, a lot of the producers who farm do not own the land, they rent it. So if some of these landlords who own the land outright aren't in the business of farming and it's a long kind of a long conversation to go into but the amount of rented land relative to the size of farming operations has grown dramatically over since the 90s so this debt to asset ratio being the same as the 90s in terms of this particular chart here i think is a bit misleading that debt to asset ratio oftentimes for actual producers is close to 30 or 40 or even 50% or higher sometimes because there's a lot more rented ground. But overall, this is this is kind of where we sit as a nation. Now talking about uh, my next slide goes into direct government farm program payments by state in 2018. And you can see in 2018, the darker the purple states are, the, the more uh, MFP that they re raised or uh, received or the more direct government payments uh, were doled out uh, in those areas. And you can see the bulk of it went to the, the mid, you know, that central U.S., North Dakota down to Texas, and then from Nebraska east to around Indiana and Ohio. And so that's what it's showing here is who received most of these direct uh, government farm program payments in 2018. In the low left, it shows kind of a box. And Iowa's the, the upper left corner. Then you, if you go across, you'll see South Dakota, Kansas, North Dakota uh, receiving quite a bit, but not as much as uh, Iowa. And obviously that was because that first MFP was highly directed at soybeans, where Iowa and Illinois uh, raise a lot of them as well as Minnesota. So they received the most in that first year. Now, if you look at the next slide, that's 2019. And it's a similar story, really. Direct government farm program payments by state, again, highly, you know, it was given by acre, if you'll recall, for MFP2, but soybeans played a big role in calculating those per acre MFP payments. And we can see that that was, again, heavily given to the central U.S., North Dakota, south to Texas, Nebraska, east to Ohio. All right, then my next slide there shows the regional changes in net cash farm income headed into 2021. So this is going to be their projection into this year without those ad hoc farm program payments of MFP 1, 2, and the CFAP 1 and 2. And the heartland area is going to, they're expecting a 9% increase actually due to the higher commodity prices. And if we look at the Northern Plains, us, really not much of a change, projecting minus 1%. So similar for in, in our case, 2021 being similar to 2020 and the big reason, the big rally in corn and soybean prices, which as you saw from the table I showed before the chart that those are our two biggest commodities and then and then followed by wheat and, and cattle. So with a better cattle prices with better, uh, much better corn and soybean prices, uh, not a big drop off is the expectation for our region, but other regions like uh, the fruit rim, the Mississippi Delta area, the Southeast, those areas that are heavily uh, cotton and, and, those, and some of those other crops, peanuts as well, uh, expected to see a big drop off uh, in terms of net farm incomes. And so the drop from 2020 headed into 2021, uh, it's not uniform across the country. And that's kind of what this chart's illustrating. So then my next slide, and this is my final chart, I promise. I don't want to chart you guys to death. 
but I just want to show the 2020 versus the 2021 forecast. Okay, so same time last year, that's the, that's the top chart and it showed 2020 being worse than 2019. So what a difference a year makes, but I just want to illustrate that these forecasts are obviously subject to great change. And uh, especially when you have a pandemic hit or you're uh, coming out of a pandemic, we're, we're not entirely sure what it's going to look like, but it's still the best guess that we have for planning purposes. And anyway, I just wanted to show that 2020 was expected to be worse than 2019. And now 2020 turns out that it was considerably better than 2019. Again, commodity price rally and CFAT payments. But then 2021 expected to be better than 19, not quite as good as 2020. But as I showed in the last chart, a lot of that's regional in terms of who's going to be the most negatively impacted and, and some area, at least one area expected to be better off. So just my final slide and, and some general takeaways from the uh, from what I was trying to show here. You know, farm program payments will be a key are a key factor in the the higher uh, 2020 numbers versus this year. Uh, and even with better than expected crop and livestock prices in the fall, leftover leftover MFP two and CFAP make up a large share of that that big discrepancy despite the higher prices. And then the loss of any ad hoc program payments will likely affect the Northern Plains less than some areas because, you know, we weren't, while, while those programs definitely benefited us, and yes, we received a fairly high CFAP payment in our area, we also are going to be the beneficiaries of the higher, the big commodity prices rally uh, and potentially better cash prices than we would typically see because a lot of this is being sold abroad uh, and, and shipped out of the Pacific Northwest, and we're the best game in town to to deliver those 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 commodities out that portal to uh, to Asia. So that's kind of what the what the report shows. That's the projection from the from the USDA headed into next year. Is that you know, and I would say in a nutshell, things are looking fairly strong, uh, and the, everyone's planning so far on any kind of MFP or CFAP not being necessary and uh, due to the better prices. Now, of course, droughts, natural disasters, those things happen uh, and they're tough to, tough to forecast. So we'll have to be on the lookout for that and wh what kind of what and if any indemnities are made. And I know that parts of North Dakota right now are very dry. Folks out West are really concerned about if they do put a seed in the ground, are they even going to get any kind of germination because it's just so dry out there. But we'll see in the coming months uh, how that all shakes out because I I was on a, a call earlier this week and folks were already asking about prevent plant for due to extremely dry conditions and um, not a very good germination scenario. So with that, I believe our next speaker is uh, Dr. Frayne Olson. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to him and wait till the end for uh, questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you much, Brian. Uh, so I want to do a really quick recap on what the USDA report was on Tuesday, some of the some of the key variables there, and then set us up for a little bit into the 2021 uh, planting season, because we got to finalize some decisions on what acres of, of which crop we're going to plant. So my first slide just provides a quick summary of the uh, updated February version of the WASD, the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates. I guess rather than going through too much of this, um, let's just drop to the bottom line, the bottom right hand corner. That's the current USDA forecast, the amount of corn that we're going to have in, in the system, both on, on farm storage as well as in commercial hands, just before harvest of next year. So the marketing year uh, for corn and soybean starts on September 1. Now, the, the, the number we had last year in January's number was, was higher than the number we got in February. So USDA did increase their forecast for total uh, corn exports, but all of the other numbers remained the same. Now we were expecting a lower number, but it wasn't as low as what the trade had anticipated. So in that little thought bubble right there with the uh, 1.39 uh, billion bushels, that was the average trade estimate. So that was what the private forecasters and some of the traders and analysts were kind of expecting the USDA number to be. So the reason we came out and had kind of a negative report for corn on Tuesday, at least psychologically, was they were we did get a cut, but the cut wasn't as large as people had anticipated. On the next slide, it's the same thing for soybeans. We were expecting the bottom line uh, for soybeans, the forecast for ending stocks, 
to be lower, and it was. Again, once again, USDA did increase their forecast for total soybean exports. And again, this is for the full 12 month period, even though we're only about five months into the marketing year, um, they're trying to forecast the, the total for the 12 months. Um, the average trade gas was about 123 million bushels. We actually got 120 million bushels, very, very close to what the trade was anticipating. So uh, kind of a neutral tone, if you will, for the results from, from the, this February WASD. Uh, moving on to wheat very quickly. Uh, the bottom line for wheat really didn't change and, and nobody was really expecting any major adjustments in the wheat. In fact, all of the uh, usage numbers, the consumption numbers were left unchanged. Uh, now, when we think about the bottom line and, and the available supplies of wheat, uh, our carryover stocks on wheat are, are really what everybody considers very comfortable right now. And again, this is all wheat classes blended together. Thus, the reason we're seeing kind of the volatility in the price, price movement in the soybean market and the corn market relative to wheat. So of the three major classes, soybean, our stocks to use ratio on soybean is by far the tightest. It, it really is equal to the record low that we saw back actually technically in 2013-14. So we are at record low forecasted ending stocks numbers. We're, we're equivalent to what we saw earlier uh, in, in the 20 teens. For corn, we're, we're kind of in the, the, the low end of the normal range, but we're getting tighter. And because of the large uh, corn exports into China, that's what's got everybody excited right now. But as I pointed out earlier, we've got to be a little bit careful as, as corn prices go higher, it does put some pressure on the profitability of ethanol industry. But for wheat, again, kind of a completely different story. In wheat, we have plenty of wheat around. Um, there, there's no been no real shock value in exports yet. The, 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 peop, the countries that are buying wheat from the United States have been our tr very traditional customers. They're buying the wheat at, at a very regular pace at a very regular, regular rate. So as we look at both old crop and now as we move into the new crop season, um, you know, this is what we're watching very closely. We've got plenty of wheat around, but we're very tight on corn and beans. Just on another footnote, um, I do anticipate for about the next week, I do think uh, the export market is going to be relatively quiet, primarily because the Chinese New Year starts today. Um, so even though it, it, it runs on the calendar usually for about 16 days, there's about one week of actual holiday that they go on in China. And that starts on February 11th, the official holiday, and then it'll end on February 17th as far as workload and, and people taking vacation time. So just be prepared for that. Don't look for any major buys over this, uh, the Chinese New Year holiday. On my next slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the size of the South American crop, because right now, that's still one of those big variables for both corn and soybeans, it's kind of unknown. Um, on the soybean side, uh, Brazil, Northern Brazil is just starting their harvest. Um, and so we're getting some early re yield reports. Their harvest has been kind of slow, first because it was planted late, and then now they've been getting some rain showers coming through, which has again, slowed some of the harvest progress. But in my opinion, it's still not at a critical level. It's not something that's really gonna have a major impact on the marketplace yet. So on this table, just really quick summary of both corn and soybean production in Argentina, as well as Brazil. Uh, the very bottom line is the numbers that we got out of USDA's forecast in, in, in February, uh, basically unchanged from the previous month in, uh, month's report in January. Uh, uh, in the top portion of the table, it talks about the, the average industry guesses. What, what, did the, what was the industry anticipating? So two big takeaways from this. Number one, the Brazilian soybean crop is going to be a large crop. In fact, a record large production. Last year's production at 126 million metric ton was the previous record. We're at 133. The primary reason for that was an increase in planted acreage. Okay, so the, the yields, the average yield across the country of Brazil is pretty much a trend line yield. It's right on average, even though there's areas that are going to be below average, some will be above average, but as a country, it's going to come out with a typical crop. So the increase is because of planted acreage, not necessarily because of higher yields. So there's some confusion about what's going on there. Now, Argentina is, a, is, is the different story. Argentina has had a more production problems, more issues that we have to be watching for. 
Um, I think as we move forward in time, we will start to see that Argentine soybean numbers start to slip just a little bit once we get a little bit more information about harvest. So the next slide is just a map of uh, Brazil. I just wanted to show you very quickly, kind of geographically, where we always talk about for provinces or their states. The big state in the north, Mato Grosso, that's where the that's the largest producing uh, region in the country, simply because it's such a large state. The darker the green just means there's more soybeans produced from a bushel count. So we're just starting to harvest in the northern regions, but there's a long way to go in, in the soybean harvest in Brazil. That's a very large distance. So just as a reference point, that top region of Mato Grosso, if you were to drive from the northern parts of Mato Grosso down to the uh, southern tip or the southern regions of Rio Grande do Sul, you'd be, you'd be driving the equivalent of North Dakota down to Frisco, Texas. So, you know, that's a very, very long distance and harvest is gonna take uh, actually several months to complete. On the next slide, it's the same picture, but for Argentina, I just wanna remind everybody, Argentina is number one, a smaller country, but their growing region is very, very compact. And so they tend to have higher yield variability because if it's favorable weather, they have really good years. If they don't have favorable weather, then they, they have some, some problems on the yield side. On the next slide, um, I just wanted to show this as a recap. I pulled this from DTN Profit X. It's just looking forward as far as weather events, what are some of the things we're gonna be looking for? Um, on the, in the pink, that would be some uh, uh, plentiful showers. Again, they're, they're starting to harvest in that Northern region. The blue is, uh, uh, they'll have a window of some drier conditions. Uh, hopefully be able to move into the harvest season. But that purple down in there that, that in Argentina, that's the one that, that's got my eye and I'm a little bit concerned about is kind of the size of that Argentine crop because the longer term forecast is that region is still gonna have some problems. All right, on my next slide, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the corn soybean ratio as we shift into the discussion about acreage in 2021. Now that we have some more information about 2020, I did want to talk about this because I know farmers are trying to kind of finalize some of their seed decisions. Um, the key to this is just to look at that red line. If you look in the middle of the, of the graphic there, you'll see a red line. I tried to highlight it as best I could. That's uh, if you take the, it's the ratio of November soybean prices to December corn futures. Now this is all futures market prices, not cash prices. We're looking at uh, November 2021 soybeans divided by December 2021 corn futures. So that's what that red line is. That's that corn soybean ratio we, we, you may have heard about. What I also did was I went back in history. So each one of those other lines that you see on this graph is the exact same ratio at a particular point in time again for that harvest delivery. And I wanted to point out a couple key things. Now notice that we, we tend to have a very tight range, trading range of from year to year to year from this February and March timeframe. And then at the very end of March, first part of April, something happens and it starts to, to disperse. It starts to get wider. And after about uh, March or April, or May, excuse me, April, or May, then all of a sudden it kind of goes off and does its own thing. The reason for that is very simple. On March 31, we get the planting intentions report. So before March planting intentions report, if you look prior to that, the futures market is trying to signal very carefully to farmers, what would we like you to do? Given the information we have today, what is the futures market trying to signal to farmers between planting corn and planting soybeans? And as you notice, that red bar is at the very top of that range, meaning where the, the futures market right now with this price ratio is saying, we need more soybeans and they're yelling it from the mountaintops. So my concern now is as we start to figure out how many acres we're gonna plant in 2021, yes, you need to use that information in the, in the futures market because that's the consensus view of what the future will be, whether we agree with it or not. But my only point is make sure that if you're going to increase your soybean plantings, if you're going to plant more acres than you have historically, try and be more aggressive in pre-pricing that as well. Because I would hate to see you add a bunch of acres of, of soybean plantings and not have those bushels covered, at least partially, partially covered. Because if we have a really big, good production year, we can oversupply the marketplace again. Just on my final slide, you're going to be hearing a lot of 
discussions about how many acres of what crop are we going to plant. I just wanted to give you some historical perspective. Please look at the three, three major crops, corn on the top, which is yellow, soybeans, which is green, and the blue, the brown, excuse me, is, is wheat. We have had kind of a 50-50 blend of about 90 million acres of corn or soybeans a couple years ago before the trade war started. You're going to hear a lot of discussion about how many acres of corn and soybeans do we need in 2021. At the end of the day, my best guess is we're going to come in very close to that 50-50 balance again. The question is, where are we going to get about 7 million acres of soybeans? We're going to have to wait to see. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pause. I uh, will hand things over to Mr. Ron Haugen. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm here to talk about the Quality Loss Adjustment Program, uh, acronym QLA. Um, just a little background. Uh, this is, uh, the, the, we all know about the WIP program that was for 2018 and 19. And some of you may have applied for that and gotten your 50% of your WIP payment, WIP plus, I should say. And um, they were always gonna add quality to that program because that was just on quantity. And they never, the government never really got it worked out right. So they came out with this separate quality adjustment uh, program. <clears throat> so you can collect on WIP plus and you can still collect on this, <clears throat> on this program. People are always asking, well, when are we gonna get the other 50% of the WIP plus? As far as we know at, that, at this point, it's still on hold along with the some people call it CFAP 3, but it's technically called CFAP AA. And when they're, typically when there's a new administration, uh, they put things on hold to review things. Uh, we don't think things are going to change in Washington. Uh, it, it'll, it will probably go out the way, it, uh, the way it was designed, but it's still under review by the new administration at this point. The quality loss adjustment was already kind of in the pipeline, so that program is ongoing. So, yesterday, then we did a we did a uh, a, a webinar with FSA. FSA presented for about an hour and a half, and they had all, all the details. And at the end of my presentation, I've got the uh, the recording that you can uh, you can link to and look at, and you can also look at the slides. So I'm just going to cover the highlights of it, uh, kind of a quick outline of the program. Those of you that aren't familiar, the, the goal of this program was to provide assistance for quality losses uh, because of uh, uh, excessive moisture, floods, droughts, tornadoes, and we see snowstorms. We seem to have all that in North Dakota, and it's for 18 and 19. A uh, sign-up deadline is very close, March 5th. Uh, we're hoping that that gets extended because that's pretty short time. This is a very complicated program compared to some of the others. Farmers will have to do their homework, dig out their their uh, their documents, and, and and provide that. So the next slide then uh, shows the eligible crops. Pretty much all of the cr all, all crops are eligible, provided they were eligible for federal crop insurance. Um, and the NAP program. There's a few there that are excluded. I'll run through some of these slides very quick, uh, but you can, you can capture them uh, on our website if you wanna look at them more in detail. Um, uh, the crops must have suffered a loss because of the, a qualifying disaster event. And um, the, the one clinker there is, it, you must have incurred a 5% or greater quality discount. So if you had just a minor discount of let's say 1% of the dollar value, you do not qualify, okay? This program is also for forage crops. They go by the nutrient uh, loss. Um, and even for crops that have been, uh, have been fed to livestock and, uh, and even maybe in storage. And there again, you need to have a lot of documentation. So next then, <coughs> the ineligible crops. Crops that are not grown commercially, crops intended for grazing, crops that are not intended for harvest, um, and tops that, uh, crops that don't meet the double cropping uh, provisions, we don't have that here, um, and then volunteer crops. And next, the uh, continued then, ineligible cr uh, crops include uh, PP crops, first seeding of forages, uh, crops that were destroyed, uh, and immature fruit, okay? Next, 
Um, here are some of the qualifying disaster events. Um, we seem to have most of them except for typhoons and volcanoes around here. And uh, so you can see the conditions that are associated with the qualifying drought and the, and the snowstorm blizzard and all those various types of disaster events. The next slide then, <clears throat> which would uh, uh, qual qualify this even more, eligible counties with a D3 or D4 drought uh, that have a presidential emergency declaration or a secretarial declaration in 18 or 19. And you can find the list of counties at farmers.gov. Now, if your county is not listed, um, you uh, can, if let's say you're a county, uh, you're in a county that's nearby one county that is listed, uh, you can uh, check with your local FSA and your county committee poss uh, possibility if you have evidence proving that you were affected, you can uh, still qualify. Next, the, uh, uh, there is some uh, causes of loss that are ineligible. Um, and and uh, so you can't uh, uh, apply if, if the loss and it, it was not due to a qualifying disaster or if it was after harvest or if it was in storage. Let's say you put some grain in storage and it went and it got in bad condition. It went out of condition. It, it got uh, really wrecked. And uh, just because that's your problem once it's in storage, uh, uh, you, you'd have to prove that, that the, the poor quality was due to the disaster and not the storage. The same way if you have grain in storage that's infested by insects, that's your problem. Also, if you have some herbicide that's drifted over, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there again, that's a, that's, a, that's a whole separate situation. And also, if you do not follow uh, proper uh, farming practices and do uh, purposely a bad job, uh, to get low quality, that doesn't count either. So next then, I've got a slide here showing a simple example. Um, let's just say this producer produced uh, 10,000 bushels of corn and it was, uh, it was very wet conditions and, the, and it was poor quality corn. And, uh, and let's say it, they also had a hailstorm on it. Everything is going wrong. Okay, and just because of the excess moisture, not the hail, but the moisture, all of those bushels qualify, all 10,000. Okay, the next example, this is a, <coughs> the same situation, except for um, uh, you grew 10,000 bushels, but only 1,000 of bushels, 1,000 bushels were uh, uh, um, poor quality because of a qualifying event. Then the, and then the remaining bushels got hailed on. Hail is, hail is kind of considered a normal event. Uh, and you, you can buy hail insurance for that and you have prop insurance for that. So only the 1,000 bushels that was affected by the qualifying disaster would count. So next, the uh, uh, next uh, slide, please. Yep, there we go. Uh, then you have the eligibility, which is kind of the same eligibility requirements for most of these ad hoc programs. The QLA, if your AGI or adjusted gro uh, uh, gross income exceeds 900,000, uh, unless at least 75% uh, uh, of your AGI is derived from farming or, or ranching or forestry. Next, payment limitations. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pretty much the same. One hundred twenty-five thousand per person. Uh, your your uh, your uh, your uh, limitation of price applies to each of the years, eighteen and nineteen. Uh, if, if you have separate legal entities, uh, of course you must to keep that up to date with your notification of the interest of the entity and any changes to the to the entity and the structure. So next. Um, there is a linkage then if you, uh, if you um, qualify for a QLA benefit, you are required to purchase crop insurance or NAP insurance in 2022 and 2023. You must at least have a 60% level coverage. Um, it, it applies to all of your crops that received a payment. Now, if you already qualified for the WIP program that had the same linkage, you have considered to already have met those requirements. So you're already okay. Next, quality discounts are associated with the loss 
uh, quality discounts that are associated with a loss that could have been mitigated, such as high moisture or insects, are not eligible. I get, I've gotten a lot of questions. Well, my corn was just wetter than wet and never dried down. That's just the nature of corn, and that wasn't considered here. Okay, are you going to have to spend more for drying? That's that wasn't covered. FSA county committees are responsible for if there's unique situations on situations that that damage could have been mitigated or not. They have the final say. Verifying the quality loss, uh, you need documentation. So hopefully you haven't chucked a lot of your documentation from 18 and 19. Um, and uh, it, it can be verified by an independent source. Uh, it, uh, it, it would be used to substantiate it. It has to be dated, uh, showing the final disposition, um, be a crop specific for the commodities produced in the year. <clears throat> so uh, quite a few things qualify there for documentation. The next slide shows the, uh, uh, continues on here, the uh, verifiable documentation must come from tests that are done within 30 days of harvest. So that kind of throws you for a loop. Well, what if I put my grain in a bin and I didn't test it? Uh, there you're going to have to have a county committee decide, but there is kind of an exception there. Grain crops that were sold uh, at the time of the uh, verifiable documentation at this time of the sale is acceptable, provided you maintained it in the bin and with proper management practices. Okay. So next, um, it, uh, go back. I think we missed one, Dave. Did, was that next? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Next one. There we go. One, there we go. Uh, forage crops, um, uh, uh, there you go by the nutritional value. There again, you need to be, uh, 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 the test of nutrition has to be done 30 days. It has to, with it of harvest, uh, you need to do it in a qualified laboratory, a state university, or anything approved by your state FSA committee uh, for, for forages. Next. And here's a, here's a table then for crops other than forages then. You have the various grading factors and basically have to calculate your total dollar value of loss. For forage crops, it's your nutrition value. And then you need to have a history uh, of your nutrition values for the three prior years. And if you don't have that, they'll contact the county committee to find out how to handle that. So next. Non-forage crops, uh, as, as I mentioned, a lot of different documentation you can have, sales receipts, settlement sheets, uh, scale tickets, uh, measurements from FSA or RMA, um, anything that's, a, that's approved by the state committee is okay. So next then, um, also acceptable records, copies of receipts, ledgers, income statements, uh, invoices of, of custom harvester, uh, uh, for the quantity affected, okay? And then um, you basically break it into two categories. Um, if you've got all the information and, and you got your total value that, that of quality loss uh, based on your own information, and then you've got your, let's say you don't have all of your information, then of course uh, we don't necessarily have a total value. What happens there is in the situation in 2019 where there was a lot of very poor wheat in, the, in, the, in North Dakota, a lot of bad falling numbers. Then um, producers uh, sold at the elevator and, they, and it showed a, a price they would have gotten. Uh, but then with all the discounts, it shows the price they actually got. Some elevators just decided, hey, we'll just get, give you a feed wheat price. Uh, well, we're not gonna even, it's just gonna be poor wheat. We're just gonna give you this price. That's the only price you really have in your documentation. So then uh, there again, that's a situation that's a, that's a situation that the county committee will have to decide. Next, um, here's just a simple example. 100,000 bushels of corn was produced. It, it, the, 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 the price was $4 with all the discounts, you only got three. You got $100,000 of quality loss. So the way it's calculated on the next slide shows um, it's basically that $100,000 of loss times 70% or $70,000, okay? 
Uh, now, remember now, this may further be, be reduced further. If uh, there isn't sufficient funds for the program, it may be prorated. So not nothing. Nobody will get paid till they find out uh, all the uh, uh, everyone's applied. So next then shows an example then where let's say you didn't have all of your information, then you would get seventy percent. You would use the county weighted average and get seventy percent, then times fifty percent. Okay. So next, um, for new, uh, for forage crops. There again, the total affected production times the price times 70%. There again, uh, all of these may be reduced. And next, um, how to apply. It's one application for your entire operation, whether it be in multiple counties or multiple states, all of your eligible crops. Uh, you do apply separately for 18 and 19. And next then, if uh, you have 14 days after signing to submit your documentation and you have 60 days to get all of your other eligibility forms, most of you that work with FSA have all that filled out. Remember March 5th is the deadline. Um, and there again, things may be prorated. The last slide now shows uh, our, uh, our webinar that we did yesterday. It's a recording that you can watch for more details on this program, also farmers.gov. So next up, uh, that concludes my presentation. Next, uh, um, Tim Petrie is up to talk about livestock. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. If we go to my first slide, uh, last Friday, two important inventory reports came out from NAS, the annual cattle inventory report and sheep inventory report that gives us numbers on a state and national basis. So I'm just gonna give a very quick rundown here. And most of you are familiar with our Egg by the Numbers newsletter. I'll have a more detailed analysis in there, but given the time, here quickly go through it. So two charts shown here on top of each other. This top one is U.S. beef cows and the one on the bottom is North Dakota beef cows. As expected, the beef cow herd in the U.S. went down for the second straight year. And so in two years there, we lost about 500,000 beef cows. And uh, so that means we're having lower calf crops. And so we'll have less calves to sell uh, in 2020 and that's supportive to prices. Uh, a lot of reasons for the decline, weather kind of at the forefront, half the cattle, beef cattle herd is in an area of drought. The whole Western states it isn't only dry in the US, but all the Western states and had fewer replacement heifers and, and so on. So uh, again, that's supportive to prices. We go down to the North Dakota side. We haven't uh, exactly followed the US uh, quite as close. And so uh, actually we've been uh, rebuilding the, the, the herd here since uh, 2012. And so we peaked out January 1st, 2020 at just under a million cows. And then we did go down 20,000 cows in uh, North Dakota just this past year. And so on January 1st, we had 975,000, the same as in 2019. But interestingly enough, if you go across the chart, we're back up right under a million at where we were back in 2001 and 2002. So, and in those 20 years, uh, I would think cows have gotten bigger and we haven't gained much in pasture, although we're probably better using it with rotational grazing and so on. But anyway, I think we were maxed out with just a, about a million cows there anyway. And uh, unlike the on the top in the US where we're still below where we were back there in, in 2001. So my expectations are that we'll level out this year, but it all depends on weather. The weather not looking the best now, but we'll see uh, what happens Otherwise, I think we'll kind of level out both in North Dakota and the U.S. But if the drought continues and expands, probably have some liquidation. So go to my next slide. Uh, Here's just where all the cattle are. Not a lot of time. Again, Texas is the biggest state and it just goes right on up to us. We're, we're number nine. So go to the next slide. Uh, uh, Here's the change then that occurred. The top one is what occurred last year. 
And uh, you see there, we lost 20,000 head. The big loss, there is the red uh, Colorado, and that's where the epicenter of drought began. We started the year in good shape in a lot of the US and in North Dakota, but they started the year dry and kept getting worse. So they were the big losers. Texas, Kansas, and Oklahoma there did increase some numbers. But if you go to the bottom of the chart, you see the year before they lost numbers. So they just uh, gained some back. So go to the next slide. Um, here's replacement heifers uh, on January 1st, beef replacements and the top slide again is the US and we have the same amount of replacement beef replacement heifers as we had last year. And of course, the you know, higher in the previous years when we were increasing the herd, but now have dropped down a little bit. So the expectation there again, what it, that our beef herd would probably level out of weather is the big wild card again. Going down to the bottom slide though, we have kept a lot of heifers in the last 15 years and kind of been a, a a lot of re keeping a lot of replacement heifers and so uh when you when you look at uh at just this past year that was the fifth highest on record there at two thousand two hundred and four thousand head and go back to 2017 the fourth highest on record and go back to 2013 the third highest had to go way back to the 60s a couple years to to get higher numbers so we're keeping a lot of replacement heifers and 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 have a lot of replacement uh, heifers and other heifers that that we background and a very good reason for that. So go to the next slide. And uh, here is one of the reasons, and this was last week's market report, but for instance, you know, heifers are always the lightweight heifers in the fall, even worse than that, but they're always discounted a lot compared to steers. Just last week, those 400 to 425 heifers, you know, steers 197 and heifers 162, so a huge discount. But go down then, get up to those 750 uh, weight uh, st steers and heifers, if you have replacement quality heifers, they actually brought more than their steer counterparts and even higher than the top end of those 750 to eight weight steers that were 141.50. So a kind of a good reason why we keep heifers and we do have a lot on hand and they all aren't really to, to go back into uh, the North Dakota herd because they're sold into other states and so on. But we just uh, keep them here because we background and 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 uh, do that. So uh, move on to the next slide. Here's our sheep numbers and our uh, sheep our breeding ewes in the U.S. have just been on a steady decline and have continued uh, downward as shown there. But again, in the case of North Dakota on the bottom chart, chart we've been bucking the trend the last couple of years and actually increasing ewe numbers uh, uh, quite nicely. If we go to the next slide, kind of to uh, show you the difference. These, this is percentage change in U numbers. And so it's not the absolute number, it's percentage change. And so you see there in North Dakota, we went up about 5%. And, uh, you know, as other states around, you can look at that, but we were, uh, you, you know, a, a pretty good increase there. But the year before on the bottom, during uh, 2019 up to January of 2020, we increased about 14%. So you put those two together there where we had a 19, almost 20% increase in new numbers in, in two years. That's by far the leading increase in, in the country. And so uh, go to the next slide, kind of shows you probably the reason why lamb prices have been pretty good. The last couple of years, barring this summer when the pandemic hit and, and prices went down, you know, a lot of lamb is eaten in white tablecloth restaurants. And so we struggled. But by the end of the year, there on top on the slaughter lambs, we came back up to uh, really good prices up there, 160, 70. And then, you know, starting off this year, the blue line on the left hand side were up above last year. And our expectations are for lambs to kind of be above that red seasonal line and and do very well and same thing down on the feeder lamb side were better than than uh, what we uh, were last year and and outside of the midsummer there when we struggled we came back in the fall so there's the market report on the right hand side there from bowman 
And uh, so you see there, I won't go through all these, but you got again, 80 pound lambs bringing up there, you know, $230, $40. And so pretty good property. And the other big thing, nice thing that's happened from a profit standpoint on the sheep industry is the bottom part of that market report that ewes are really, really selling well, a lot better than they used to when we'd only get $20, $30 per head for a ewe. Uh, Mexico just came in gangbusters on mutton and, and it got a lot of mutton from us last year and, and sparked the the U price plus we had fewer and you know fewer numbers and so our supplies are down and 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 good very good d demand for lamb and even for mutton to export so you see there in the bottom part of that you got call use 200 pound call use bringing a hundred dollars a hundred weight so you know all of a sudden we're getting two hundred dollars a ewe and then with the lamb prices it's uh, really helping the sheep producers out and stirring some interest so i believe that's my ending slide and we'll move on to dave thanks tim uh just have a couple of quick comments about what's going on in energy uh right now uh coming up uh at the end of our hour so we can get to questions as well uh Frank talked a bit about ethanol. Really right now, ethanol is kind of on the receiving end of what it can get. And, and, and really that's looking at high corn prices. Uh, looking at biodiesel at the same time, we're seeing really high vegetable oil prices, 40 cents a pound, which is uh, about as high as it ever gets uh, and really squeezing the, those margins. Uh, looking at, at what's happening in terms of production and use, ethanol again is, is just used primarily for blending uh, with gasoline to provide octane. And so just like gasoline, we're about 90% of last year's numbers. And again, we're coming up at that uh, time of year when, when COVID uh, really came about. And so we'll see uh, you know, exactly how we recover going forward. Some bigger pieces of news going forward, kind of looking at what's going on and even more longer term than what I have up here is really what the, the new administration is going to do with climate and carbon in terms of agriculture. It's going to have significant implications and, and what I'm taking now is two minutes will likely become 20 minutes or an hour uh, later on this year as, as their plans come about. Uh, we are waiting uh, for the, the new administration to issue uh, those numbers for blending uh, for biofuels in terms of the renewable fuel standard. Uh, so those will give some indication of what they plan on doing. And then of course, the, the renewable fuel standard, the second renewable fuel standard, you know, it, it essentially times out next year where the guidelines provided in statute uh, no longer apply. And so there's a little bit of discussion now of exactly what uh, federal biofuel policy will look like as EPA has the ability to decide, uh, you know, what those levels will be going forward. They've actually had that type of flexibility for biodiesel, uh, for advanced biofuels for, for quite some time, but is corn ethanol uh, kind of reaches that 2022 period, we'll see uh, what the plans might be. Also really important related to, to biofuels, to, to transportation fuels, uh, crude oil prices in this country have, have really uh, been on a bullish streak and now they're already in the upper 50s, uh, which puts a lot of uh, projects, a lot of uh, rigs back into the money, uh, which has implications for uh, the state of North Dakota. I'm sure you heard in the last two weeks that the, there was an executive order to halt uh, Keystone, uh, which is you know troubling for the, the, the petroleum industry, for the fossil fuel folks, and potentially having some implications for DAPL. Um, and of course, Dakota Access Pipeline, when it came on line four years ago, really had a, a, a positive impact on North Dakota light sweet prices, uh, really shrunk that spread between WTI and the prices that North Dakota uh, oil gets. Big news yesterday was that there, there was a postponement. There was a really originally supposed to be a hearing uh, on DAPL yesterday. That's been postponed. The, the industry, the fossil fuel folks are taking that as negative news uh, in terms of, of what may happen with that. And of course, that's in terms of the courts and the administration may take the liberty to issue an executive order, which could put things to a stop quite quickly. Uh, in response to that, that $50, almost $60 WTI price, uh, North Dakota rig counts are, are rising, but only slowly. We're at 15 right now, which is nowhere near where we were a year ago or at the peak. Uh, just some quick prices uh, uh, in terms of what's going on in terms of the margin. 
Um, so right now, the margin, again, my, my rule of thumb is always this 50 cents a gallon is where things are looking pretty good. We're below that right now. Ethanol prices are higher, but again, they're paying uh, a, a lot more for corn. So that good news for the, the, the North Dakota, Dakota farmer uh, as bad news for the, the corn ethanol refiner. And so right now, uh, you know, using USDA's numbers from last week, you know, those Dakota corn ethanol refiners are paying about 525 a bushel. Uh, much higher than it was, you know, even a few months ago and, and really hurting that margin. There's a little bit of wiggle room uh, in terms of ethanol prices, uh, but not much again, because it, it really is dependent on, on gasoline use, you know, it, moving up with those corn prices been distillers grains. And then I already mentioned the, those corn oil prices, those vegetable oil prices, uh, which again are squeezing, you know, helping in this case, the corn ethanol refiners, but squeezing the biodiesel folks. And again, just looking at that chart using weekly numbers from EIA, you see that 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 pink uh, value, you know, definitely lagging where we were a year ago. And again, coming up on that that collapse in in production and use uh, resulting from COVID. I bring up a chart I've, I've shown before, but just to let you know this is numbers are already about a year old. Um, but this is the break even price for new wells by by formation in the country, and so we see Bakken. A little bit to center right there in orange where the the break-even price for a new well uh on average across all the people who responded to the survey was 51 bucks we're clearly above that now uh which is definitely a good sign you know taking that as is, is, is somewhat optimistic or bullish uh for what might happen in north dakota again there's a lot of concern going forward uh in terms of the dapple being available heard discussion in the industry that a lot of folks are really hesitant uh, to, to, to return like they would have otherwise, knowing that it might be difficult uh, to, to get freight out of state. You know, if, if DAPL is closed, uh, you know, abruptly, it could really uh, disrupt things uh, moving forward. Uh, so that's what we had for questions and, uh, excuse me, for our presentation, ready to move on to questions. I'll bring all the panelists back and we'll work through these uh, as we can. I wanna thank uh, everybody for, for sticking on with us uh, for a, a relatively uh, longer presentation day, but you know uh, some some good stuff. So I'm just going to bullet through, and, and I think many of these will be ending up going towards Ron. Uh, so just with our first one, any updates on CFAP three, uh, including the twenty dollar per acre payment that was in the year end relief bill? Yeah, as I mentioned, that's on that's on hold with a new administration, so we don't we don't know yet. Um, yep. And uh, they actually, I think they're calling it CFAP AA, which I don't know if AA stands for Alcoholics Anonymous or what, but it's, but. Prices anyway. are high, Ron, so I'm not, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it related question about the final whip and CPAP three payments, will they be there? And of course, you've already alluded to that. Yeah. Um, next question, uh, will the administration change? Yeah, with, with the administration change came a change in executive orders, uh, including USDA for egg reserve pro programs assumed to mean an increase in CRP, uh, a redirecting of farm programs to green initiatives. Any thoughts on the long-term impact of these executive orders on farm programs, crop prices, or farm revenues? So Ron, if you want to take a first stab at yeah, that. I don't, I, I guess I haven't given, I've been just concentrating on the details. Somebody, maybe uh, Brian or Frayne or Tim could answer, or you as well could answer that better than I could. Yeah, and I just say from, from the green standpoint is standby. It, it's going to be interesting to see what they actually come out with and how. Um, but the, 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 clearly the indication is that they're going to be aggressive in using uh, agriculture to address their concerns about the climate and exactly how they roll it out. It, it really isn't known. Um, the, the general thought is that it will be in terms of uh, incentivizing or providing payments for uh different activities that support or, or you know, reduce uh, carbon emissions as opposed to strict regulation, but really we don't know much right now. As I kind of mentioned, I think we'll know a whole lot more in the upcoming months, you know, maybe by, by Earth Day, you know, that it seems like the administration is going to have a, a, a lot of activity that day that we might have an idea what they want to do. I, I will add though to the, to the CRP thing, when they reduce the rental rates for CRP, uh, in the last farm bill that kind of provided a disincentive to probably go into CRP. And as far as cropland going in with the latest rally we have, it's unlikely that folks are going to choose 
to enroll in some of these programs with a reduced rental rate actually being paid on top of a pretty strong commodity price rally this fall, even if they increase uh, enrollment or the enrollment numbers. And I can't remember exactly what it was. Was it, what was it, 27 million was the new target? Is that, that may be wrong. But I know they increased it a couple of million acres, but then they reduced the incentive to actually put it in. And then we have that at the same time that we had these commodity price rallies. So I don't see a whole lot of folks running to the door to put into CRP here in the, this year. Um, so, that, so that's just a plug on that because that was part of the question. But if anybody else has thoughts, that's, I'll shut up. If there's no other comments, moving on to the next question, which I think is more for Tim. Yeah, I, uh, I've see, I see it, so I'll go ahead and take it. Yeah, it all depends on your uh, budgeting there, but uh, calf prices are still relatively high to the heavier weight. So if you're buying calves now, uh, probably need to buy them at the lower part of that range. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a tight situation with feed, and it all depends on when you price your feed. Now, on the other hand, if you're backgrounding calves now, it's a so you already have men, that's a sunk cost. You've already given shots and everything else. So now your only variable cost is really feed. And then did you price it last fall? Or even if you have to buy it now, still pays to put on weight now up to what you usually do. So, uh, you know, a couple of different answers there. And again, it's all a budgeting thing. What, what, what are your feeds that you have and, and what do they cost? So let's go on to the next one here with uh, Ron. Yeah, I see the next question addressed to me there about that 5% threshold on quality. Um, the, the way I understand it is that you it's all of your farms, all of your fields put together, and you don't add any, any loads that don't have any quality problems. You take them out, and any, any uh, loads that, that have even, uh, even a, 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 a small percentage of quality uh, discount, you you you, add, you you take the five percent out of all of your bad stuff. So if all if you have two loads that are just one percent, you're out of luck. But if you have let's say two equal loads and one is is uh, twenty percent and one is one percent, you're going to get over the limit or you're going to get over the five percent. And that's the way I I interpret it, and I believe I understand that correct correctly. So. <clears throat> And just one thing to add to that. So I did a backgrounding scenario seminar about a month ago and Tim followed me on that. But yeah, it, when he talked about it, when I ran that, and I don't know if the person who asked that question saw it, that assumes you are buying and paying at the current price. And like Tim said, if you have those prices locked in, then that budget looks a whole lot different. And the big price hit was to 850 weights, 800 weights relative to feeder calves and fat cattle. So basically the feedlots were paying money or docking or paying money, however you want to look at it, to put weight on. And every scenario I ran out of the five, no, six, actually, it paid to put, it still paid to put on weight fast. I mean, that's that no matter what I did, you either lost the least money or made the most money putting on the weight, even with corn prices and DDGs and silage being much higher. Uh, even if you budget in, factor in those higher costs, it's still paid to put on weight. And so I, I just want to make sure I said that. Great. And that's all the questions we have. Uh, give everybody one last chance if they want to share one. Is there any comments that any of the panelists have or any thoughts they had with the other presentations? Um, if not, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, again, uh, the slides and a, a recording of this webinar will be uh, posted to the URL on your screen. Uh, that should happen the next day or two. Uh, also, we'll be back in, uh, four weeks from today uh, on Thursday, March 11th with our next uh, webinar. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I hope you guys all stay warm. Thanks. Thanks.